Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Is back. We got the dear professor Alexander Salter, economics professor at Texas Tech University. Very smart guy, has a lot of educational credentials, and we are going to chop it up about mask mandates in schools and get into some of this inflation stuff happening in the country. Professor, we're Facebook friends now. Did you know that? We are Facebook friends. I'm very excited. You know, I accepted you because I knew you on the you're going to be on the show, and I didn't want to be rude, so <laughs> so I accepted your free request. No, you're a good guy, man. You just misguided on some politics, but let's talk about your sentiment. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about. We'll start with mask mandates in K through 12 education. So share your sentiment with us. Sure. In brief, I don't think that mask mandates in K through 12 are very effective. I don't have any reason to think that they are particularly useful at stemming the spread of the virus. And to the extent that we roll those back, however, I want to make sure that we do that legally. It needs okay. to be done through the established legislative and executive processes. All right, so there was a report that came out about a month ago that showed the effectiveness of schools that enforce the mask protocol. Now, while it does not eliminate the spread, it does decrease it based on uh, comparative data from school districts that simply do not have a mask protocol in place compared to school systems that do. So there's an effectiveness. Is it 100% effective? Of course not, right? You're still dealing with people who do not exist only in the context of a school system. They exist in the ecosystem of life. So they go home, they have a peer group, uh, they have parents, uh, they, they have uh, you know, after school jobs, whatever it may be, they interact with other people. So you would agree, Professor, that Having a mask policy inside of your school, while it does not stop, it does in fact reduce the spread of COVID-19, correct? Based on data. I'm sure there's some effect. I would tend to say that cloth masks are probably a little bit better than nothing. and 95s are better still. The question is, are they worth the cost? If we have kids constantly worrying about fiddling with their masks instead of paying attention and getting the most out of the learning environment. If we make teachers constantly monitor this to make sure that students are quote unquote wearing the masks right. When you take into account the fact that now that we know children seem to be one of the least at risk categories from any of the variants of COVID-19. I just don't think that the benefits of school mask mandates outweigh the costs. We need to make sure that our children are getting the education that they need. They should be there to focus on school and not worry about these secondary requirements, especially after the last 18 months, which have been very hard on school children in particular. You brought up an interesting point, Professor, that I would like to challenge you on. You call children the least at risk. Who's the most at risk? The most at risk are the elderly and then also people from the general population that have some other health problem. We usually call okay. them co comorbidities. All right. Do children interact with their grandparents or parents? Certainly. Do children they do. interact? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do children interact with individuals that may have pre existing conditions? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I bring that point to your doorstep because we're not dealing with a health problem, we're dealing with a public health problem. We're not dealing with a health crisis. We're dealing with a public health crisis, which means all of our policy should be implemented based on the public health concern rather than the individual concern of a particular person. And that is the difference between a public health crisis and a personal health crisis. So when you say, well, children are least affected, that's fine if you're only talking about it in the context of a personal health issue, such as your personal medical doctor. But when you talk about it in a broader context of public health professor, you then have to include the reality that children touch things, that children interact with people, that children go homes where they have elderly grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, etc. That children interact with family members and friends that may have pre existing underlying conditions. That is the reason you have policy is for the general public, not for the individual. Where am I wrong here? I think you're absolutely correct that no man is an island. We understand that there's an issue about transmission. We understand that there's an issue about one person infecting other people, sometimes without even knowing it. What I want to fall back on though, what I want to talk about is the fact that we know through several studies that schools just aren't super spreader events. 
So if we're serious about masking our kids when there doesn't seem to be major contagion happening at school, we should be even more on board with masking up everywhere all the time. But I think that we know that we're past that point in the pandemic. I think that we understand that that's not the optimal strategy. Maybe if everybody had resources to get an N95 and if maybe everyone was using them with medical grade filters, if everyone was using them perfectly like a surgical team does in a hospital, maybe then we could talk about the benefits of widespread masking outweighing the cost. I just okay. don't think we're there anymore. So let me say this from experience. So one, you're not correct on the super spreader element. You do have school systems that that based on their testing, they were getting 20 to 30% positive rates and they, they had to shut the school down. That's considered a super spreader event anytime you're over 15%. So that has happened and that continues to happen even now. As far as the mask are concerned, I actually agree with you. I do think that we should continue the subsidies, the federal subsidies to make sure K through 12 education, if you're gonna meet a person, you have the proper mask attire and you can subsidize that to the general population because people are going to buy different masks based upon the information that they have and the resources they have available. Um, This to me is very simple. It's not complex, we make it complex, it's real simple. We believe that it was in the interest of good public health doctrine to vaccinate children and to mandate these vaccinations. Uh, We have been mandating vaccinations in the United States of America since 1850. In 1970, it became rule of law for all 50 states and the District of Columbia to mandate a plethora of vaccines for children, diphtheria, measles, mumps, etc. We accepted that as a public health issue, right? So it's interesting to me that individuals who have accepted that line of thinking to say yes, School systems have the power and truly it is the right thing to do to mandate vaccinations for children. Are the same people saying that wearing a mask mandated by a school system is not proper. I don't understand the logic because both are public health policies and both are implemented or authorized by the school system by way of mandate. But one is actually intrusive, a shot is intrusive, a vaccination is intrusive, a mask is not. So why the different line of thinking as it relates to mask and not that same line of thinking as it relates to the vast vaccination mandates that have been around since 1851? Great questions. I think we need to take two separate questions here that are there. One, you wanna make sure that you're doing all of these decisions, whatever they are through established procedures. You wanna make sure that if it's something that requires an act from the state legislature that you actually do that. You don't wanna necessarily have governors who are in faraway state capitals just issuing executive orders willy nilly without respect to the facts on the ground. So I think that you and I would would, would agree with that. With respect to the other vaccines, I would note that We've had decades of evidence on the effectiveness of the polio vaccine, for example, before we required it for public school students. I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, I'm comfortable taking this stuff. Nonetheless, this is still an experimental drug and experimental treatment rather. So I think that we shouldn't be too gung ho about requiring that people inject themselves with this if they have some But we're not talking about that, Professor. We're still talking about the comparison of mask mandates, not vaccine mandates for COVID, but mask mandates in schools. You, you may have an issue with COVID-19 mandates, that's fine. Uh, I can argue that the science has been around for 22 years uh, and that, that's used in the COVID-19 vaccinations. And it has been tested thoroughly and even more so than many of the other vaccinations, in particular polio uh, in the United States. And, and polio was a disaster in the first two years of its rollout. Uh, and I'm sure you know the science on that, but we've accepted it as normative. So when it comes to masks, masks are non-intrusive. Um, I go, I still speak in high schools. I still speak in elementary schools. And when they thought they had a grip on it, right? People were coming back to the classrooms. I was in those schools and I was speaking to students. They had their distance, they had their mask on. And I gotta tell you, brother, not one school classroom that I spoke to had a problem wearing a mask. I did not see people taking it off. I did not see young people fiddling with it, none of that. I mean, they were well behaved, okay? So I don't get the logic of saying, School systems have the power to enforce these other mandates, dress codes, um, other mandates as it relates to vaccines. But they don't have the authority or somehow they're wrong for saying wear a mask for right now for the sake of public policy and health. 
I don't disagree with that point. I think that it's established law that school boards have the authority or school districts or whoever's making the relevant decision to have the authority to require masks. Yeah. I'm saying that in my view, requiring masks in K through 12 school children just doesn't pass the cost benefit test when you think all things are considered. All I'm right. not saying it's illegal, I'm just not sure it's expedient policy. All right, well, I do disagree with you on that point. I do think it the benefit far outweighs the discomfort momentarily. Uh, and children are very adaptable. They can become accustomed to environments very quickly. Uh, and 52% of parents are for um, the school system having these mandates. Only 28% of uh, parents of school aged children oppose them. Uh, the others are indifferent to it, but they would like the school system to make the choice themselves and not executive orders like you said. Uh, let's talk about inflation. Uh, inflation is happening in the United States of America. Give me your thoughts about that. Uh, you are the PhD in economics here. Too much purchasing power, chasing too few goods. In mm -hmm. some ways, we haven't really advanced any beyond what Milton Friedman taught us decades and decades ago. On the one hand, we have lots of boosts to demand. Normally, government spending fiscal policy doesn't do all that much to boost demand, but I think that the COVID direct checks are an exception to that. I think that those probably had an effect. Of course, you had extraordinary monetary policy by our central bank, lots of liquidity in the system. Add that to the supply constraints, transportation gridlocks, all other sorts of problems with the supply chains and the predictable consequences, prices go up. You know, brother, I agree with virtually 100% of what you just said. The problem in the narrative is that individuals would like to be not authentic in their argument and debate about it, where they would like to blame Biden, right? Well, you can't lay this solely at the, at the feet of Biden because uh, while I disagree with some of his policy positions, he has attempted to do things in order to ease the burden of inflation in the United States. And yes, the number one catalyst for inflation is basically a supply chain issue. And that supply chain issue, it takes a process to get that right. And inflation also carries kind of a natural reset in the American economic system. And you see some of that reset happening. Why do you think conservatives are so quick to forget about the four years of Donald Trump and how inflation takes time to set in? And they squarely blame Biden for the inflation issues that actually started to permeate during the Trump administration. Sure, I think everybody does it if we're being honest. I think conservatives do it, I think that liberals do it. I think that too many people have this expectation that the president of the United States, whoever that person happens to be, has direct control over these things like inflation, like gas prices. These ordinary 10 cent things that mean so much to ordinary Americans that are really due to global economic forces that are very difficult for anyone, even someone as powerful as the president of the United States to control. I would like to see us as a nation and have a more realistic perspective on what the president can and can't yeah. do about the economy. Yeah, and to Biden's credit, he did release the reserve on the gas thing to try to ease the cost, uh, drop in the bucket, you know. Professor, always a pleasure having you on the program, man. Thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure, thank you.